Snow. Snow everywhere. Antarctica, an endless expanse of ice. White expanses of glaciers. Frozen mountains and plains. So white that the reflected sunlight almost blinds. And there's absolute silence here. Penguins and wild animals nest along the coasts, leaving the interior of the continent completely lifeless. I shuddered and woke up. The familiar sounds of snow crunching and the vibrations of the Haglund's BV-206 reassured me that everything was okay, and the tracked vehicle was speeding towards its destination. Yet for some reason, I felt a deep sense of unease. I got up from my place and headed towards the pilot's cabin. On the way, I passed by Lily, who was running diagnostics on the auxiliary control panel and Billy, who was fussing with his rifle in the cargo hold. My model of Haglund's BV-206 is a modified version, significantly larger in size and equipped with separate cabins for various purposes. Thanks to my achievements in science and my position as an officer in the Military Research Center in Antarctica, I was able to acquire this multifunctional transport for scientific work. I was proud of my Haglund's BV-206 model, as I had been involved in its development. Reaching the front of the vehicle, I silently looked through the armored windshields at the white wall of a snowstorm enveloping this boundless world. Of course, I could simply access the external camera feeds from the command center, but I trusted my own eyes much more. Everything seemed to be in its place. I hesitated for a few moments, then turned to the driver, Joe. Did something just happen? The young man looked at me puzzled. Um, no. Oh, a few minutes ago, the instruments detected a slight spike in seismic activity, but I was warned that this happens regularly in this area. Don't worry, sir, we'll reach the station in about half an hour. All right, but keep an eye out, I said, frowning. I returned to my cabin, poured myself a cup of coffee, and then headed to the command center. Lily, contact the research laboratory. Tell them we'll be arriving soon. She paused her diagnostic work, activated the transmitter, and sent a request to connect to the facility we were approaching. For several minutes, there was only static on the channel. Lily furrowed her brow, then repeated the call, extending the communication antennas to their full length. Still nothing. I took a sip of coffee. What? Is no one answering? She studied the monitors, then said uncertainly, No, it's not that. It's just... Um... It seems our signal isn't getting through for some reason. I scratched the back of my head. Then contact the Army Command. Ask them for updated information on the status of the facility. Lily did as instructed, but there was still no response. Her face darkened slightly. Sir, I also can't establish communication with the Army Command. It seems all communication channels are down. I remained silent for a few moments. Lately, establishing a stable connection had become somewhat more difficult, but we had never experienced a complete communication blackout. Does this mean we're completely cut off from everyone? Is it because of the snowstorm? Lily hesitated. I can't say, sir. A regular snowstorm shouldn't disrupt the signal this badly. It's probably a malfunction. The chief engineer mentioned something about needing to replace old parts in the transport's communication block. That doesn't sound very good, I said, rubbing my temple. My innate acute sense was troubling me. I remained vigilant for the remainder of the journey. Minutes passed, but nothing happened. After half an hour sitting in the pilot's cabin, I noticed the research facility. The structure looked more like a small fortress town than a scientific base. It was dangerously close to the ocean shore, surrounded by a thick wall with powerful towers aimed at the dark waves. A large dome-shaped structure, painted white against the black sky, towered over the formidable fortress. It resembled a gigantic, perfectly smooth egg. The facility didn't have an official name. It was simply known as BIO-4. 
Like many similar centers, it conducted research in the field of climate change. However, given that the facility was also guarded by a military garrison, I assumed secret research was conducted here as well. Joe, slow down and be cautious. We gradually decreased speed as we approached the settlement. The lights of the Haglund's BV-206 soon illuminated a small park of vehicles parked in front of the building, apparently waiting to evacuate personnel. For a moment, I felt a twinge of fear. The entire facility seemed empty, inhabited only by ghosts roaming its streets. However, then powerful floodlights on the wall lit up, cutting through the snow and flooding the surroundings with bright light. We drove up to the vehicle parking area and parked nearby. At that moment, the heavy gates of the fortress opened and a lone human figure emerged into the blizzard. With a sigh, I opened the vehicle's door and stepped out into the cold. I approached closer and scrutinized the stranger. The man was tall, strong, appearing to be about 40 years old. He was dressed in black thermal wear, similar to what I wore over which he had an unzipped parka. He had dark hair and calm, intelligent eyes. His stern and tired face was set in an impassive expression. Overall, everything about the stranger spoke of experience and discipline. I stopped a few steps from him, saluted in accordance with military protocol, and said, I'm Captain Andrew Stanley, here to assist with the evacuation of personnel as well as the transportation and preservation of scientific research data. You were supposed to be informed of our arrival. The tall man lingered for a few moments, studying me, then nodded in response. I'm Captain David Foster. He extended his hand to me and said in an even voice, Welcome to BIO-4. We entered the fortified settlement grateful for the opportunity to take shelter from the snowstorm behind its thick walls. There, we saw groups of soldiers patrolling the area between the buildings. They all looked tense and tired. Captain Foster led us deeper into the complex, sidestepping the central dome-shaped structure. His walk was firm and confident. Under my command are about a hundred military personnel. We are protecting over 50 scientists and civilian staff members. Until recently, everything was going well. But as you can imagine, right now we're all eager to get away from the ocean. I raised an eyebrow. Everything was going well? Foster grimaced. Yes. We were conducting research deep in the ocean when suddenly there was a series of intense seismic activities, leading to earthquakes and a shift in the ice cover. Several icebergs broke off from glaciers and ice shelves, and valuable divers were lost at ocean as a result. It's unknown what's causing these still recurring natural phenomena, but now the ocean is rising beyond its shores. It would be best for us to leave the station. He paused for a moment, then asked, what's the situation at the center? Command took quite a while to respond. Frankly, I expected more substantial assistance. No offense, Captain Stanley. I shrugged. In the center, it's business as usual. Too many tasks, too few specialists, excessive bureaucracy, and a lack of budget and time. Changes are happening all across Antarctica. Politicians are increasingly discussing the topic of natural resources, and we're on the verge of open competition, a fight for control over this continent. It's clear that the military presence here will only grow and strengthen, officially in support of scientific projects, of course. Command understands this, so their main focus now is to stay as close to leadership as possible. In such an atmosphere, the problems of a small laboratory are pushed to the background, or even further. Please don't take it personally, Captain Foster. He stopped and looked at me with a somber expression. You're quite straightforward, Captain Stanley. I think we'll make a good team. What do you plan to do first? I scratched the back of my head and said, I need to report to command about my arrival at the facility. The communication system in my transport is down. You've lost contact with command too. 
Yes. What? You too? Are you also cut off from the army network? Captain Foster was silent for a second, then nodded. All communications stopped about an hour ago. At this moment, we have been unable to establish a new connection. I could reluctantly admit that due to a minor malfunction, my masterpiece of engineering thought, the Haglund's BV-206, lacked the capability to break through the growing field of interference enveloping Antarctica. However, a facility like BIO-4 was supposed to have an extremely powerful communication system, if even they couldn't connect to the outside world. Something's not right here. I couldn't explain the reason for the sudden communication blackout, but the consequences of not being able to communicate with Army Command were extremely unpleasant. Upon arrival at the destination, I was supposed to receive further instructions. I looked at Foster. This is really strange. No offense, but a remote research center in the middle of nowhere, suddenly losing touch with the outside world. It's all a bit eerie. This disconnection has nothing to do with what the scientists are working on here, does it? Captain Foster smiled. I understand why you might think that. However, I want to assure you that the research conducted in this laboratory is absolutely safe. I myself am partly a scientist, but the work done here is mostly theoretical. Of course, there are also practical experiments, but they are all under strict control, ruling out any possibility of unforeseen situations. The worst that can happen is someone making a mistake in an electronic spreadsheet and getting a scolding from the old man. He seemed sincere enough to me. Well, if you say so. The old man you mentioned, is he an important person whom I need to take to safety? Captain Foster nodded. Yes, the chief researcher. He's a bit eccentric, but his intentions are good. At least in most cases. I was just about to introduce you to him. Then lead the way. We entered an elevator and descended underground. Soon I found myself in a spacious room that resembled a lecture hall. There an elderly man in a white lab coat was discussing something with a young assistant. Foster cleared his throat, drawing his attention. Professor, this is Captain Stanley. He has been sent to assist with the evacuation. He is also personally responsible for your safety. Foster looked at me and added, Captain, this is the chief researcher of Bio-4, Professor Brandon Miller. The man in front of me was a rather well-known scientist in certain circles. He was about 80 years old, or even older. His skin was as thin as paper, under which knotted blue veins were clearly visible, and his neatly groomed hair was completely white. However, the old man's eyes still shone with a sharp intellect. I hesitated for a moment. Professor Miller, I'm truly honored to finally meet you. I've heard a lot about you and your work. The old man smiled. You know who I am, Captain? How flattering. It's nice to see that the younger generation still values such little-known scientists as myself. His assistant, a young woman with dark hair tied in a bun, smirked. Indeed. I thought all military personnel only know how to boast about their weapons. I gave her an impassive look. For your information, I'm also a researcher, and I've taught at a military academy for several years. Several scientific papers have been published under my name. Professor let out a good-natured chuckle. Don't be so harsh, Vivian. In any case, then we are in your care, Captain Stanley. What now? Are we leaving the laboratory? Vivian frowned and looked towards the other end of the hall, where many scientists were busy copying data onto external storage devices and anxiously scurrying back and forth. I shook my head. We can't contact the Central Command right now, so it's hard to say. There will be news once we re-establish communication. It may take some time, but much depends on the information we receive. We might still be delayed. The young woman, Vivian, 
sighed with relief. Ah, great. I was afraid we'd have to leave much of the data behind. We'll continue preparing for departure then. Professor Miller watched his assistant walk away and sighed. Don't mind Vivian, Captain. We're all a bit on edge these days. I shrugged. I understand. The situation is indeed difficult. Outside, the snowstorm still raged on the continent, immersing reality in a murky white haze. In such weather, it was easy to fall asleep and freeze to death. Passing along some structure, I hurried into the building where the sleeping quarters were located. A few hours had passed since my arrival at the station. Soon, my subordinates were supposed to restore communication. Honestly, I was eager to leave this place. As I entered the building, my subordinate Billy met me, and together we headed to the recreation room. How did your meeting with the professor go, sir? He asked. We had an interesting conversation. He's a remarkable man, I replied. He definitely needs to be brought to a safe place. The weather concerns me, sir, Billy said grimly, looking out the window. And this station, I don't know why, but it feels eerie to me. Do we really have to wait for directives from the leadership? As I was about to respond, my assistant Lily entered the room and interrupted me. Captain, sir, it's all very bad. The situation is still not entirely clear, but there has been a series of earthquakes. The road and some bridges have collapsed. Deep cracks have appeared all over the southern quadrant. But the worst part is that a disaster occurred at our main base. Central Command has suffered. Some of them are trapped under the rubble. I managed to speak with Colonel Richardson. But then the connection was lost again. What about our orders? What does Command want us to do? Did the Colonel manage to convey anything? Lily sighed. The area between this station and the nearest base is deemed too dangerous to cross. The entire Antarctic center has been affected, but its southern outskirts seem to have suffered the most. So, we can't return. The previous evacuation plan has been canceled. From the look on Billy's face, I could tell he was on the verge of uttering curses, so I swore instead. Damn, what now? Are we just supposed to stay here and wait for the ocean to swallow us? Lily shook her head. We've received new orders, sir. Since evacuation by land currently seems impossible, a naval convoy will be rerouted to us. If all goes well, it will reach us in two to three weeks. We are ordered to wait for its arrival. Billy sighed gloomily and anxiously said, Three weeks in this eerie laboratory, but it should be doable. I too was not thrilled, as I disliked traveling aboard ships. Being locked in a metal transport in the middle of the ocean, the thought of it was not too appealing. But on the other hand, crossing hundreds of kilometers of treacherous terrain with soldiers and civilians, without reconnaissance data from command, amid natural disasters happening here and there, seemed like an even worse idea. I had to admit there were no other options. Understood. I guess we've arranged ourselves a little vacation. Billy, relay this news to Captain Foster. Lily, start preparing. And I need to meet with Professor Miller. As Billy left the room, the assistant approached me and said, Sir, I also need to tell you that before the connection was lost, Colonel Richardson said something strange. From her tone, I could tell she was hesitant. However, Lily continued. The Colonel added that our base was attacked by, uh, some flying entities. What? Attacked? Entities? I didn't understand. Yes, to be more precise, it seemed to me that Colonel Richardson said, uh, monsters, flying monsters. Ah, uh, monsters? Are you sure? No, sir. There was interference on the line, so I'm not certain. It was strange to hear such a thing, and the expression on Lily's face indicated that she was not lying and was also confused. 
But what was worse, my heightened sense was sounding an alarm. Maybe our main base really was in a situation beyond conventional threats. I pondered for a moment and decided to set this question aside for now. We need to restore communication with the center, prioritize solving this problem. Talk to Captain Foster. Maybe he can help, I said. Lily saluted and left the room, leaving me in somber thoughts. Considering we were to spend at least two weeks at the research center, I instructed my subordinates to make themselves at home. My Haglund's BV-206 was brought within the fortress walls, and we decided to use it as living quarters instead of settling in one of the buildings. Bio-4 was a large facility and offered us many opportunities to entertain ourselves and pass the time. We could eat in the dining hall, relax in one of the game rooms, or even visit a small library. Several days passed in relative calm. We failed to re-establish communication, and we were clueless about what was happening on the continent. It was troubling, but what could we do in such a situation? I watched the black waves crash and retreat, licking the rocky shore near the high wall of the fortress. I had developed a habit of coming here once or twice a day, perhaps in hope of seeing the naval convoy. Of course it was foolish, as their arrival was days away. Nevertheless, every time I watched the waves, I fell into a contemplative mood. Days went by, a week passed, then another, but there was no sign of the naval convoy. With each day, the situation at the station worsened, the water was rising, and we understood that we couldn't stay here much longer. However, I couldn't disobey the command's orders, and neither could Captain Foster. We continued to wait. Then, one morning, which was no different from the evening, a familiar figure of Captain approached my transport. David? What happened? Foster looked up and was silent for a few moments. Dark circles lay under his calm, tired eyes. Yes, something happened, he said. Taking a deep breath, the captain continued. One of my soldiers has gone missing. The missing soldier vanished from his quarters in the middle of the night. His absence was noted in the morning when he failed to report for his duty. He was one of the experienced soldiers on track to becoming an officer. Being late was out of character for him. On the way to the barracks, I started asking the obvious questions. Did you search the facility? The captain nodded. Yes, in all the places he could have had access to. There are no traces of him anywhere. What about the surveillance cameras? Did they record anything? Foster clenched his teeth, then shook his head. Most of the surveillance system was knocked out during the snowstorm. What little remains is practically useless due to interference. There are no recordings we could use. We arrived at the barracks and proceeded to the missing soldier's personal room, in front of which a few people were already gathered with worried expressions on their faces. Entering, I felt my unease growing because there was nothing there. Nothing in the small room indicated that something had happened. There were no signs of a struggle, no drops of blood, no unusual smells in the air. It was as if the soldier had indeed somehow vanished into thin air. After a while, I looked at Foster and asked a somewhat awkward question. Could he have deserted? The captain stared at me uncomprehendingly. Where would he go? Even if someone went mad and decided to flee from the remote station, there was nowhere to go. Foster added, I was hoping you might notice something I missed. Did you find anything? No, nothing. The entire facility was combed through by the garrison soldiers. Foster even decided to open up the dome of the old observatory. But inside, there was nothing but old equipment, darkness and dust. Then, the captain sent soldiers to comb the coastal plains outside the fortress, but no traces were found. A sense of unrest spread throughout the isolated fortress. And while people crowded together in the game rooms or rest areas to relieve tension, I, Foster, and Professor Miller gathered in the security center for an emergency meeting. 
there are two possibilities. First, he may have genuinely deserted. Perhaps the soldier did go mad due to isolation. It happens, especially when you know you're cut off from the rest of the world, I suggested. David just shook his head. There was no hostility or readiness to defend in his gesture, as the captain was not one of those leaders who doubt their people or themselves. He didn't have that fragile pride that would make this statement sound offensive. It's highly doubtful. I knew this soldier well. He was a resilient man. Nonetheless, that would be the better outcome. Since the second option, to put it mildly, is more problematic. It entails that the soldier was killed by another person. The killer then disposed of the body and erased any traces of the crime. Considering it's not easy for an ordinary person to kill a trained, experienced soldier, the most likely suspect would be one of your own people, David. Professor Miller sighed heavily. Do we need to continue this conversation? Without traces or clues, it's all futile. Captain Foster, I know you trust your people, but you should conduct an internal investigation. And you, Andrew? The professor turned to me. I would ask you to take your tracked monster and circle the area again to look for any traces. Maybe something will turn up farther from the facility. That sounds like a plan. However, what happens if none of us find anything? David wondered. Then we just have to wait for the naval convoy to arrive and hope that no one else disappears, I replied. The people locked inside the facility were already tense and exhausted, but the new unknown threat made their mood even darker and more unstable. Many held on because of the hope for the imminent arrival of the military ship. And as the search continued, new safety protocols were implemented. Civilians and scientists were prohibited from staying alone, and a system of mutual accountability was created. Living quarters were equipped with additional sensors and alarm locks. Many soldiers were pulled from the walls to strengthen internal patrols and ensure compliance with protocols. To my disappointment, I couldn't find any traces. Foster also discovered nothing. Several more days passed. I was in the Haglund's BV-206 when David came to me. He looked at me with a clouded expression and said in a somber voice, Three more people have disappeared. And not a single new clue was found. One of them was a soldier, another a scientist, and the third a member of the civilian auxiliary staff. They had nothing in common, no thread that tied them together or to the first victim. All three vanished from different places, and they were last seen at different times. Captain Foster and I investigated all the residential areas and sections of the facility they frequented, but again found nothing. We need to conduct internal investigations again, interview witnesses and all that. You don't mind if I take the lead on this, do you? I said wearily. David glanced at me sideways. Do whatever is necessary, I'll help. But what concerns me most right now is the panic at the station. I trust my people, of course. Even tired and in isolation, they'll remain disciplined. However, civilians are a different matter. They could become problematic. And the best way to solve this problem is to prevent it from arising. For that, we need to understand what's happening and prevent any more disappearances. Easier said than done, I said. With those words, we moved on to the next agenda item, interviewing witnesses. According to the previously introduced safety protocol, everyone at the station was assigned a buddy. No staff member was to be left alone under any circumstances. The interviews revealed nothing substantial. The mutual accountability buddies of the three victims said the same thing. The disappeared were with them throughout the day, but vanished at some point, completely unnoticed. The scientist and the civilian staff member disappeared by the time their partners woke up, and the soldier seemed to vanish when his comrade turned away to service one of the wall cameras. Only after the remaining soldier reported his partner's absence did it emerge that two more people had disappeared. 
None of the three victims behaved strangely or showed any anxiety before vanishing. We simply had nothing to grasp to unravel the mystery. We're just spinning our wheels, David spat out angrily. The captain looked tired but still collected and determined. I leaned back in my chair, tiredly thinking about a soft bed. We're powerless now, but we need to take additional security measures. Foster grimaced. If the two of us feel helpless, how do the others feel? When is the naval convoy arriving? I silently shook my head. You know what happened at Central Command. I have big doubts that the ship will arrive in the coming days. Better to prepare for the worst. Soon after, Captain Foster made a statement confirming the importance of the updated safety measures and ordered all station personnel to follow them precisely and introduced even stricter mutual accountability measures. People were forced to always stick together, log their arrivals and departures in special ledgers, share cramped living spaces, and be confined to areas of the settlement related to their direct duties. They couldn't even go to the bathroom by themselves. Despite all this, four more people vanished the next day. There were still no traces. It seemed that the killer, whomever it might be, didn't care whether a person was alone or in a group. The mutual accountability system was not working. Everyone was scared. The following day, seven people disappeared. Four of them were experienced soldiers, and the other three were scientists. The day after that, five more people were gone. No clues were found, and fear continued to spread through the facility like a plague. It hadn't yet turned into panic, but the inhabitants of BIO-4 had already begun to show signs of distress, finding themselves in a suffocating atmosphere of horror, fatigue, and doubt. That evening, I stood on the southern wall of the station, looking at the turbulent black ocean. The cold waves lapped at the stone surface of the beach, carrying bits of ice with them. The wind howled, and the full moon shone in the dark sky, surrounded by an unearthly red glow. After a while, a clumsy figure climbed up the wall and approached me. Billy looked as tired as everyone else, but he was holding up comparatively well. Captain, I have an idea. May I share it? I nodded silently. Billy hesitated for a few moments, then said, Well, it's about the bodies. By now, we've searched every inch of this facility. We've also thoroughly searched the coastal plains. You've probably combed through it all countless times. And yet we haven't found a single drop of blood. It seems we've looked everywhere, but in reality, there's one place we haven't searched. Since the bodies are nowhere else, they must have been in this place, in the water. It's the only logical conclusion. Billy finished speaking and leaned on the wall's edge. The black waves continued to churn, indifferent to his words. The inscrutable ocean remained unchanged. I was silent for a while, then nodded. Yes, I've thought the same, so I'll keep a close watch on the beach. Billy nodded, lingered for a few moments, then left. I continued to watch the ocean. I thought, this doesn't make sense. Even if the killer is disposing of the bodies by throwing them into the water, someone would have noticed something by now. Dozens of people have already disappeared. All of this is very strange. As I pondered, two more people climbed up to the wall. One was a soldier, and the other was a scientist. I turned and looked at them with a bewildered expression. Since I was standing close to the ladder, the newcomers had no choice but to confront me. I remained motionless for a few seconds, then stepped back, giving them way. The soldier and the scientist calmly approached the edge of the wall, climbed over it, and jumped down. One of them landed successfully, but the other hit the rocks and fell silently. The wind carried the disturbing sound of breaking bones, I rubbed my face, continuing to study the ocean. 
The soldier headed towards the waves while the scientist crawled. Gradually, the icy water reached the soldier's knees, then his waist, then his chest. Finally, he disappeared under the wavy black surface and drowned. At this time, the scientist had crawled far enough to reach the water's edge. His figure also silently dissolved into the cold waves. Nothing remained of the two of them. Standing atop the wall, I continued to watch the ocean calmly. Huh? What was I thinking about? Ah, yes. It is strange that no one had seen anything. How do the bodies get dumped into the ocean without anyone noticing? I continued my contemplation. Maybe my theory was wrong and the killer wasn't using the water to hide the bodies. The water certainly looked inviting. Suddenly I felt a strange desire to swim. But I came to my senses in time. A swim? What am I crazy? Who swims in the freezing water during the winter in Antarctica of all places? I said to myself, and shaking my head, continued to watch the beach until I noticed nothing suspicious. Another two days passed, during which five more people disappeared. Despite increasingly strict security measures, David couldn't prevent the disappearances. It was all in vain. All this time I continued to come to the southern wall, silently watching the ocean. Something bothered me as I looked at the dark waves, and my keen intuition suggested I was close to unraveling the terrible mystery of the disappearances. Hearing light footsteps, I looked back and saw Vivian, shivering from the cold, approaching me. Hi, what are you doing? You've been hanging on this wall for several days, she said. I'm conducting an investigation. Vivian stared at me in disbelief. You... you're doing nothing and think I'll believe that all this is part of an investigation? Both you and Captain Foster have been completely useless. So many people have disappeared, and neither of you could find the slightest clue. At that moment, another person appeared on the wall. It was a mature woman in a white lab coat with a calm expression on her face. We stepped aside to let her pass, not paying attention as the woman silently climbed over the edge and jumped down. Her eyes reflected the wavy darkness of the ocean. I frowned slightly, hearing the sound of a body hitting the rocks below and shook my head, instantly forgetting about it. Believe what you want. Vivian glanced at me for a while, then sighed and turned away. Sorry. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We just need to hold on for a few more days until help arrives. But you promised to protect the professor. Instead, you're sitting on this wall. That's unacceptable. Gods, how dedicated can she be? The professor this, the professor that... Can't this girl think about herself for once? She's in danger too. I rolled my eyes. Who said I left him alone? My subordinates Joe and Bill are with the professor. They've been watching over you and the professor 24 hours a day, every day, since all this chaos started. At that moment, another person climbed to the top of the wall and jumped down. Vivian opened her mouth to say something, then closed it again. After a long pause, she finally managed to squeeze out a few words. Well, okay. Then I guess I'll go. Suddenly, she stopped and looked at the ocean. She furrowed her brows. These dark waves should have swallowed this station long ago. Sometimes it seems to me that the ocean is playing with us. At that moment, I was struck as if by lightning. What? What did you just say? Vivian looked at me, puzzled, and repeated, Uh, it seems to me that the ocean is playing with us. No, I'm not asking about that. What does it mean that the waves should have swallowed us, swallowed the station, all the same things that were already known? Have you forgotten? Due to seismic activity, the ocean is rising beyond its shores. We were supposed to leave the station. It's just strange that we're still alive. It feels like... What? Uh, what was I talking about? What? Why? Vivian stopped speaking and stood as if petrified. 
Then she looked at the ocean again. She climbed over the fence and jumped down. I heard the crunch of bones and silently watched as the young woman crawled to the dark waves. She drowned. The moon was gone, but I still stood on the wall, watching the ocean. Suddenly tears streamed down my face, and I felt a pain in my chest. I didn't understand my feelings, but it seemed very sad, desolate, as if I had lost someone dear to me. What's happening? Why am I crying? Why does it hurt so much? Why do my instincts keep screaming about mortal danger? I rubbed my neck and saw blood on my hand under the street light. Suddenly, I had a severe headache and lost consciousness. In a feverish dream, I heard Professor Miller's voice. We're tired, even sleep doesn't help. I always wondered why. Now I understand, it's too late. But listen, child, I'll inject you with a serum. Maybe it can. If you feel better, convince Captain Foster to take this medicine he refused me doesn't trust. But that's all I can do to help. Unfortunately, I understood too late and saw those creatures too late. I woke up in a ward where light softly seeped through the blinds, enveloping the room in semi-darkness. My head was heavy and my body felt as if it was cast from lead. For a moment, I couldn't remember what had happened to me and how I ended up here. Trying to gather my thoughts, I cautiously propped myself up on my elbow, feeling weakness in every muscle. Looking around, I realized I was in the station's infirmary. Pristine white walls, a bed with an adjustable headrest, a bedside table with a pitcher of water and a glass. In the corner of the room, a medical monitor blinked rhythmically displaying my health indicators. I noticed a white envelope on the table next to me. I tried to get up, but my head spun and I fell back onto the pillow. I had to admit I was too weak, but I still managed to grab the envelope. It contained a letter from Professor Miller. It had just a few lines with a strange message. Soon I won't be here anymore. They've realized that I can see them. Just don't give yourself away. Pretend you don't notice them. When I felt a bit better, I got out of bed and slowly approached the door of my ward. The corridor was silent, broken only by the faint humming of the ventilation. Exiting the room, I was faced with a reality that seemed like a nightmare. Terrifying creatures hovered above the station, monsters that resembled giant bats, but with even more sinister features. Their bodies were hairless, and through their translucent skin, red-blue veins were visible. They looked like vampires from children's horror stories, but the screeching of their wings was too real to be considered fiction. Finally, it all came to me. I pieced together the details in my head and realized how wrong I had been in my foolish speculations. Quickly dressing, I rushed towards the security center. I urgently needed to find Captain Foster. As I walked through the settlement, many people looked at me. Some appeared scared, some angry, but all were very weary, emaciated and pale. Why hadn't I noticed these changes before? The monsters continued to hover above the station and no one but me seemed to see them. Following Professor Miller's advice, I tried to act as if I didn't notice the flying bloodsuckers overhead. I saw how these creatures occasionally descended to lone victims, touching their necks. And every time they flew back up, the people's faces became even paler and more worn. Arriving at the security center, I found Foster sitting silently with a grim, tired expression. He looked very fragile and pale. I sat opposite him, rubbed my hands to warm them and asked, Where's the professor? Edward silently looked at me, and from his gaze, I understood that I had failed the mission, and Miller was no longer among the living. I looked around. It was just the two of us in the room. All these creatures were outside. I took a deep breath and said, when the first victim disappeared, I said there were only two possibilities, that he had deserted or had been killed by another person. 
but there was a third option. Right before all this chaos started, my assistant Lily passed on a strange message from my boss. To put it shortly, he told me that flying monsters had attacked the main base. At that time, I didn't pay enough attention to this information. Well, I was wrong. These flying creatures have attacked us too. David frowned at me with a grim reproach. What do you mean? I hesitated a bit before responding. It all becomes obvious if you take two things into account and then put them together. First, the bodies. People don't just vanish without a trace, and yet we found nothing. Not at the station, nor on the coastal plain beyond the wall. Thus, the most obvious answer, the bodies are taken where we can't find them, into the water. After all, there's an entire ocean out there. I'm sure these flying creatures came from the ocean. Captain Foster wanted to say something, but eventually fell silent, waiting for me to continue. The second clue or cause of all this chaos is the seismic activity. Perhaps because of earthquakes and colossal fissures across Antarctica, monsters we had not yet seen emerged from the permafrost. I know my words might seem like madness, but it's true. You have to believe me, David. Captain Foster shook his head. All this sounds, to put it mildly, far-fetched. It's very hard to believe, but let's assume you're right, Andrew. However, your theory doesn't fully explain everything. Yes, we pulled many soldiers off the walls to strengthen internal patrols, but the ocean is still being watched. Nothing could have crawled out from under the waves, grabbed people inside the facility, and dragged them back into the water unnoticed. I smiled grimly. Correct. But the problem is that we didn't see them. Our minds, our memories were manipulated. They somehow got into our heads. That's why no one noticed anything. Captain Foster looked at me as if I were insane for a while then finally asked, Do you have any proof? I pulled out the serum that was in the envelope along with the letter from Professor Miller and placed it on the table in front of David. The man gloomily looked at the vial of liquid. Did the professor inject you with something? The captain asked me. Yes. So you know that I refused him? David said coldly. I know. He came to me. I remember his words in fragments, but he said I should persuade you to take this medicine. What do you think I'll do now? The captain asked me threateningly. David, you must understand that I'm not lying. There's horror and total chaos outside. I saw it with my own eyes. I repeat, I'm not lying to you. I've presented you with arguments. Nonsense. Captain Foster loudly interrupted me. Everything you've said is just a mad theory from an officer driven insane by isolation. I fell silent, contemplating my next words to convince David. However, the captain spoke again, and his voice was full of anger. This station, the people in it, everyone who's left, I must protect them. Don't interfere with me, Andrew. Do you understand? If you continue spreading this nonsense, I promise you'll regret it. All right, Captain Foster, I understand. We'll wait for the naval convoy. I reluctantly replied, realizing that David didn't believe a word I said. What? What convoy? Did you call for additional military forces to the station? Captain suddenly asked me. I looked at him in shock. He had forgotten. To be honest, I had almost forgotten why I had come to this facility. But now... What do I do next? I stepped out of the security center and saw one of those creatures approaching me. It flew towards me and clung to my neck. I felt a sharp pain. And at the same time, I was enveloped in a pleasant feeling of warmth. I tried to pretend that I felt nothing and did not notice how my blood was being drained. But it was hard to endure. After a while, the flying monster released me and flew away. 
I returned to the Haglund's BV-206 and saw Billy fiddling with his rifle. Next to him sat Lily, who was working with a diagnostic program on an electronic panel. I thought I needed to pour myself a coffee since I felt very tired. When I returned to my cabin, I accidentally discovered in my pocket a strange letter from some professor and a vial with an unknown liquid. Why am I carrying this with me? I thought, and laid down to rest for a bit.